latest segment of Ace Day Sports Take. I'm Lauren Pendleton, joined by my guests Eddie and Tristan. Um, our topic for this segment would be: What accolades do NBA players? What accolades do y'all do y'all think the NBA players should have to be considered for the Hall of Fame? I'll start with you, Eddie. Um, I actually don't think there should be any accolades required per se. Um, there are players who are in the Hall of Fame right now who who are you know, without a shadow of a doubt deserving to be in the Hall, but they don't have certain accolades. Uh, Reggie Miller, he's a five-time All-Star. That doesn't pop off off the screen, but he does, never made an All-NBA team, never been an MVP and stuff like that, but we know that Reggie is absolutely deserving. There are players like Tony Kukoc and Arvita Sabonis who played overseas who don't have the accolades as uh, a, a Michael Jordan or a Kobe Bryant, but they are deserving of uh, to be in the Hall of Fame as well. So I actually don't think that uh, there should be like a certain, oh, they have to do such and such. They have to make such and such all-star games. They have to be all NBA. They have to be a DPOY or an MVP. Like I just think it's kind of too technical when you get down to it because there are some players who do have maybe all NBAs and all-star appearances, but they may not be as deserving because the accolades aren't everything. They're a part of it, but they don't tell the whole story. Because um, there's players like uh, Amari Stoudemire and Joe Johnson who have who were good, who were good for a short stretch, but I wouldn't say they're deserving to be in the Hall. But then there are players like Ben Wallace who just got inducted in maybe two years ago, and he's a four-time DPOY winner, won, champion, won a championship with the Pistons and things like that. And his, his accolades doesn't pop out the box like others, but you would say he's more deserving, in my opinion, than those other guys. So that's my take on that. Tristan, same for you. So with the accolades conversation, I think there should be a set standpoint of what could get you into the Hall of Fame, not what's going to make or break you get into the Hall of Fame. Like, for instance, like if you're in top five all-time scoring or if you're in top five assists or rebounds, uh, steals, <laughs> whatever, whatever category you're in, I think that should be able to dictate your, if you're on the Hall of Fame or not. Because if you come into the league and you're on a team that's absolutely poo and you take them to the playoffs, whether it's the first round or even all the way to the NBA Finals, and you – don't necessarily maybe win a ring, but you're still averaging 30 and 12 assists, let's just say, for instance, then I still think you should be able to have that as the part of the conversation to put you into the Hall of Fame. And, and I mean, and this is not to discredit Eddie because Eddie made a good argument, but the fact of the matter is, is that when it boils down to it, and it's the same thing with the GOAT debate, Jordan or LeBron, the one thing that always comes down is accolades, accolades, accolades. So why would you save the accolades for the GOAT conversation, but when it comes to who deserves to be in the Hall of Fame, which is one of the most prestigious honors you can have as a basketball player, why do you want to avoid having those accolades there, but you want to bring in the accolades like rings, points, rebounds, wins, losses, teammates, so on and so forth, and a GOAT debate? Okay. So, like, oh, you have something else? Yeah, I was. that's a very fair point. I think, and like, I think it's just for my, I think, like I was saying, the awards or the numbers don't tell the whole story. We can, we can have a, this is a beautiful example. Derrick Rose. Derrick Rose, he's an MVP. He may be the only MVP to never get in the hall. And it's like, I'm going to just be honest, of course he got hurt, but based off his career and what he's done in his career, I don't think he deserves to be in. But I feel like there's a lot of people who will be like, oh, he's an MVP, he's an MVP, such and such. But he had a three-year stretch, maybe, where he won the MVP award, and he had three years where he made the All-Star team. And then after that, he's been... So, yeah. so just let me clarify. You want to say the youngest MVP in NBA history does not deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. The guy that... Made Joe Kim Noah dominant center in the league. You want to say he doesn't go deserve to go to the Hall of Fame? The guy that tore his ACL twice has really shouldn't be able to play the game of basketball right now. Is pretty much a robot in his leg, and still was able to drop fifty points when he was on the Timberwolves. Was still able to score efficiently when it matters most. I mean, yeah, he's not able to dunk like a John Moran is, like he could in 2012, 2011, but you want to say the youngest MVP in league history should not be in the Hall of Fame? That should discredit anything you say about the NBA for the rest of your life. <laughs> I think, like I said, but that's what I'm saying. Youngest MVP ever, great. But look at his career. 
if we if we just gonna be, he had 20, 2010, 2011, the Bulls were the number one seed. Uh, they made it to the conference finals and they got smoked by Miami. He won the MVP award. He made first team all NBA that year. 2012, he made first team all NBA that year as well. His numbers kind of went down a little bit from his MVP year. He got injured um, against Philly. Uh, and that was, you know, the, and after that, he just hasn't been, you know, on that caliber of player ever again. And of course, it's unfortunate. Of course, you never want to see injuries. But I'm saying, a Hall of Fame career is not just based off of two or three good years. It has to be a consistency over time. And it's like, yes, he's the youngest MVP ever, award winner ever, which is a great accomplishment. But I think you have to have at least, you know, like five, six, seven years of just straight, like, not, not saying you have to be dominant, but of just, you know, stellar play. And he just doesn't have that. And... It's unfortunate because obviously he would, I would th believe, if he was able to stay healthy. But I do think that even though he made Joakim Noah, you know, look like Shaq sometimes or, or had that Bulls team elevated to a level that we know they weren't supposed to be at, per se, I don't think he deserves to be in the Hall. That's just me. So what about – and, Laura, I'm sorry to step on your toes a little bit because I kind of want to hear what you have to say too, but what about Brandon Roy, who is one of the – best shooters in the 2000s. He never made an NBA Finals. He never went to the championship. He never won league MVP, for crying out loud. And he got hurt. But still, some people say, based on your argument of accolades should not matter, he's someone that should be in the Hall of Fame. I don't think Brendan Wood should do it. This is me. Wow. I don't think Brendan Wood should be. He, like I said, he had, he was killing, but he had three or four good years. And I'm not saying accolades don't matter, but I'm saying I don't think there should be like, uh, they have to have at least certain X, Y, Z amount of such and such. That's what, so I believe accolades do matter, but in certain cases, like how I brought up Ben Wallace, they don't tell the entire story. Because Ben Wallace, he, he's, he's, what he did on the court wasn't flashy. It wasn't, uh, get 30 a night, which is what all the casual fans look at. And they'll say, like, Draymond Green, I believe he deserves to be in the Hall. Yes, absolutely. I believe, <laughs> I believe Draymond Green deserves to be in the Hall. But the casual fan is going to be like, oh, triple single. Or he's averaging eight points and ten rebounds and six assists. But his impact on that Warriors dynasty is so – it's 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 unbelievable. He's the second second most important – we're not gonna get into that. Anyway, but yeah, because you know what you're about to say is false. He's more important to the Warriors dynasty than Clay Thompson is. Absolutely. Man. All right, somebody Absolutely. cut his mic off right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. So, Lauren, get him. Get Absolutely. him, Lauren. Get him. Okay. Get him. Well, honestly, I was just gonna gonna bounce off of what you said. Like, who are some players that y'all think had the potential to be Hall of Famers like early in their career, but just have fallen off towards like, no, nah, they're never gonna be in the Hall? Because honestly, I can say y'all might fight me, but who cares? James Harden had potential to be a Hall of Famer back in Houston. Okay. Wait. That's a fair take. Wait, 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 wait. So you're saying he doesn't deserve to be in it? No. He's like, if you think about it, he's a loser. He's a great player, but he's a loser in terms of winning. He what? gets right to where he needs to be, and then he doesn't really he doesn't impact the game enough to be to have winning teams. Same but thing could a, be safe for Russell Westbrook. Right. Do you think about what do you think about Yeah, Russ? he had the potential to be a Hall of Famer once upon a time. No, see, no, no, that's a fair take because, I mean, you look, look at it this way. You had guys that, as Eddie had said, dominant for a few years, but now he just hasn't done anything. I mean, look at what James Hardy has done in Los Angeles right now. He went against a Memphis team that was the <coughs> worst team in the NBA and lost. And, and I get there's 82-game regular season, so you can't dictate a player by one win or loss. Yeah. But how can you go from winning a league MVP every other year, trading with Russell Westbrook and maybe a Kevin Durant that was on the Warriors team, which we're going to get back to your Warriors <laughs> thing later. <laughs> but um, how, how can you sit here and, you know, be against that when, I mean, that's honestly the fairest take I've ever heard someone say about James Harden. I mean, he has lack defense. He has no work ethic. He's pretty much like a mini Shaq back in the day when he was with Kobe. He has no work ethic. He just goes there and plays ball. And I'm not saying he's a bad basketball player, but in the grand scheme of things, Lauren's right. He's a loser. Yeah. Can you really say that he has really affected a team in a positive way? I would say. A team, not himself. A team. Or a certain institution. 
Okay, well, I'm going to address the first. Well, first off, he is technically he is a loser. Um, but James Harden, literally one of the greatest scorers of all time, had a stretch in Houston, bro, where he was like, he averaged like 30, like four or five years in a row. He was the MVP, one of the best teams in the league. They made deep postseason runs. Yes, they didn't win, but are you going to call Allen Iverson a loser? He wasn't a loser, though. Why, why wasn't he a loser? How far has James Harden made it in the playoffs? I mean, he's been to the finals, just like AI did one time. Okay, but he, he, he made an impact, huh? I mean, I think James Harden made an impact. I think AI, AI actually – AI actually made that for one finals appearance, and after that, he never made it back to the conference finals. Made it to the second round a couple times, and then that was it. The same thing with, I think James Harden. <laughs> I think James Harden truly like I don't. I think it's undoubtedly like he's supposed to be in all. I think he's one of the top five greatest shooting guards of all time, actually. So I think like he hasn't won like a hardware per se, but I do think he has has an impact on winning. I know he's not. He can be a diva and. All that, all that nonsense. But I do think that he has had an impact on winning. We just seen that Rockets team when they had Mike D'Antoni. The system was built around him. He had the spacing, the shooters on the floor. He was the system. He was the system. They pushed the twenty, the twenty eighteen Warriors, who were arguably the greatest team of all time, to seven. They, they literally like, if they would have beat Golden State, I believe they would have beat. The Cavs in the final. Yeah, but that wasn't just James Harden I mean, that true, did that. He true. had Chris Paul on that team. He, I mean, look at what the Warriors did to everybody they faced up to that. Or no, maybe that was 2015 when they had Zaza Pachulia and they were injuring, you know, Kawhi Leonard, Chris Paul. Jay. I think even James Harden had got injured in a series when they were facing the Warriors team up to that <laughs> point. But you brought up AI and how he didn't make the conference finals or anything after that. But what has James Harden done since he's been to the finals? He hasn't been back to the West. Well, I mean, he did go to the I guess Warriors, but he didn't go to the NBA Finals. I mean, and true. neither has Allen Iverson. I mean, and the and the argument can be made maybe Allen Iverson has had the best supporting cast that maybe a James Harden has had. But when you look at it in the grand scheme of things of, okay, what has Allen Iverson done when he faced that Lakers team in the finals? If they don't run into that Lakers team, and, and you know, you, you got to play the what-if game sometimes. I don't like playing it, but you got to play it sometimes. But if they don't run into a Kobe Shaq Lakers team, arguably the 76ers won the NBA finals. Arguably. Allen Iverson is one of the greatest, if not the best, shooting guards of all time, if he does not play the one. I get you can make the argument for Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant, but when it comes to a sole player running an isolation game, nobody's touching Allen Iverson, and I will die on that hill. I think AI is – who y'all going to get mad at me today, boy? I I'm already mad at you for saying <laughs> Clay Thompson's not important. <laughs> no, okay, no, we got we got one minute left. Clay Thompson is important, but in order for the, the Warriors' success, I think Draymond Green is more vital. And this is why. Of course, the Splash Brothers, all that. But I think, first off, he's – well, obviously, if we're talking about their championship years, he's the anchor to their, to their defense. He's cap. The, what is that? How is that cap? Cap. How? He's the, he's the heart and soul of the team. Cap. Like, when he – They're lo- – have you not seen I'm talking, play right now? But this is – oh, I'm talking about when they were winning their chips. This is what I'm talking about. They're older. They're older now. But I'm saying Clay Thompson – if you want to talk about Draymond Green now, you look at Klay Thompson now. He ain't doing too high either. Trust me, I know he's on my fantasy team. Uh, oh, man, he's terrible. But, yes, I think Draymond is more important, just the energy he brings, how his, his uh, facilitating, his defense, his rebounding, everything he does, the intangibles that he brings. I think it's just more important than what Klay did. But, you know, we were running out of time, so. Eddie, we definitely gonna have some conversation after this because, <laughs> woo, woo. but um, thank you all. Thank you to my guests Eddie and Tristan. I'm Lauren Pendleton, and you're watching A State Sports Day. ASU TV shows like Red Wolf Roundtable. ASU TV News, Westside Football, and more. Gain real life experience while doing what you love. Get involved with ASU TV today.
ASU TV, covering all your favorite sports. From Red Wolf Roundtable to Westside Football and more, ASU TV has you covered. Tune in now to ASU TV for news and coverage on these sports and more. the latest segment of A-State Sports Take. I'm Tristan Harlan, joined by my guest Chase Weeks and Jesus Huentes. And our topic for today is, should the use of natural grass be mandatory in sports stadiums? So guys, I want to kind of set the mood a little bit, set the scene. We've seen many NFL players and many FIFA players really tear their ligaments in their leg when it comes to the use of turf. So my question for you guys this morning is, what do you think about the use of turf versus the use of natural grass in sports stadiums? I'll go first. I think that it's, you know, not overblown, but I don't, I don't think it's as big of an issue as other issues. Um, like for, and you're talking NFL specifically, or talking just in any general. Sport. Talking any sport. I mean, I think for soccer, you know, natural grass is better, but for football, you know, I think if they, if the league wanted to implement, you know, a rule like right now saying like any new stadiums, you know, uh, propose have to have natural grass, but you know I don't think it's a spending two billion dollars reconfiguring every football stadium that has astroturf. You know, for what will amount to maybe five injuries a season, I just don't think it's that big of an issue. Um, you know, as opposed to you know some other things that are going on in the league. Right, no, and that's a very that's a very fair statement. I mean, I doubt the NFL is going to have a lot of new stadiums proposed in yeah. from now in the next 30, 30, 40 years. But you know, just looking at it from the whole standpoint, Jesus, what what do you kind of think about it? I think it's different between both football and soccer. I guess those are the two biggest uh, sports played on that type of field, aside from maybe rugby. Uh, I can't talk too much on that. I'm not too knowledgeable on that, but. I think soccer for sure is definitely played better on uh, natural grass. You get more uh, traction just when you're st stepping in and trying to kick versus uh, football. You don't have as much planting per se, especially, well, maybe the linemen. But, uh, you know, it's not like Chase was saying, it's not too many injuries to say to make it such a big deal. But I don't think it should be mandatory. But as you see now, uh, since the U.S. is holding the World Cup, in 2026, I think, uh, SoFi Stadium had to pull out just because they weren't willing to make that switch from turf to natural grass. So a uh, financial component comes into that game. So it just yeah. – well, And, you know, people are saying that a lot. Well, a lot of stadiums are, like, bringing in artificial – or not artificial, they're, like, bringing in sod for the FIFA games, you know, just to have them. I mean – I. I'm guessing they're just laying plastic and then just laying sod out over the whole field. But they are there are a few stadiums that are just switching to natural grass for, I don't know, like two weeks or whatever for those games. Probably like a month tops. Yeah. So, and just looking at it from a whole football standpoint, you know, some may say, some players, some Division One players – are you know known to say that the grass actually adds a layer of padding for you know the receivers, the cornerbacks, even some running backs to really plant their feet when they jump or when they cut or when they do all their you know moves within the game. So is it safe to say that because of the cost that natural grass will end up making the NFL pay in the long run? Do you think it's a safe bet to say that? maybe natural grass won't be mandatory in the future? I, I don't think it will be mandatory. Um, you know, and I'm just – I'm not talking about the maintenance of grass when I said $2 billion. Right, I'm right. talking about, you know, for example, uh, the Superdome, which is 100% uh, artificial uh, lit. Like, there's no windows, no anything in the stadium, so they're going to have to spend however many hundreds of millions of dollars altering the stadium. But – you know, one of the things I saw when I was looking this up is, you know, some wide receivers and running backs like uh, artificial turf because it allows them to, uh, you know, 
be faster on the field because, you know, when a, a turf is wet and all that, you're not going to get as much traction, as much grip on the turf. And I looked it up, uh, the percent or the chances of being injured over the season for 2022, it was 0.048 for artificial, for real grass, it was uh, 0.035. So, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, 30% more, but it's, I mean, we're talking about fractions of fractions of a percent. And in 2021, it was 0.42 to 0.41. Like it was, turf was just that much more dangerous, I guess you could say, than real grass. It's not, that's what I'm saying, it's not that big of an issue. Right. Jesus, do you, what do you think about that? Um, I think it also comes out in player preference. I know uh, some college uh, athletes probably have played barely minimum on turf just because, uh, especially like low level uh, high schools, they go from high school to high school playing on natural grass just because maybe their school can't afford turf and they get to college. And it's like a different, I guess, playing style that they have to adjust to since they're playing on turf. So I don't think it will be mandatory, but I think a good amount of players, I, I want to say I probably 50-50. Actually, if I was, you know, I do think that turf, because you're talking about, you know, it being a whole lot softer and it, you know, for the most part, it is uh, real grass is softer. And I think that's on how they put the turf out there. Um, I mean, it's come a long way since the 60s and 70s right. where it was literally like this concrete floor. They would just lay about literally half an inch of that AstroTurf, and that was the playing surface. Now there's about uh, an inch and a half or two inches of sand and, uh, you know, those rubber pellets that get all in your shoes. And then there's like a maybe a half inch of foam. I think that, you know, maybe they need to look into increasing the amount of foam underneath the turf. Okay. Um, because, you know, for real grass, I mean, you have a good six inches of that soft uh, ground underneath it. And uh, it goes, for AstroTurf, it goes that turf with the sand, a little bit of foam, and then it's hard gravel underneath all that. You're, you brought up the year it was introduced. I want to ask, yeah. do you know the team and what league it was first introduced with? I don't what, know what the league, but it was in the uh, – uh, it was in Houston. What, what's the, you know, the eighth wonder of the world? Astrodome. The Astrodome. That's Astrodome what I was, yeah. by the Houston Oilers. Yep. The revolutionary, groundbreaking invention that the Houston Oilers implemented when they built their now vacant Astrodome. Um, yeah, and, you know, that was uh, not a mess, but, I mean, it was like sandpaper almost. Like right. just all the road burn and all that um, from the AstroTurf that they had at the at the time. And it's, you know, it's come a long way, and I think it, you know, it still has – a long way to go in terms of, you know, uh, you know, making it a lot safer on the field. Right, and you got to think, too, when it comes to the turf versus grass debacle, um, you know, the, the shoe really is another point of, our, point of focus that you have to make because with natural grass, of course, you're going to want to wear cleats so that you can really plant your foot yeah. and stick into the ground. But with this turf that even a lot of baseball players are seeing – they just wear indoor, you know, indoor facility use. So, like, normal shoes, like, you know, the shoes yeah. you have on could be used inside those facilities. I don't know about my hey dudes, but <laughs> it is what it is. But do you think the switch from cleats to, not to like, legitimate, like, running shoes would be another focal point of issue? I think that, you know, it, it, the shoes could be an issue uh, or something to look at. I think that they're – definitely could be like a hybrid shoe you know maybe not like a golf shoe where it's a lot smaller cleats but something right. very similar to where you have traction in you know the shorter grass but you still you know have control um similar to cleats right hey zeus what about you what do you think about you know the switch of from cleats to natural shoes or even maybe the hybrid that mr weeks introduced i feel like most athletes are used to cleats so it also be kind of hard to convince them to try and wear a hybrid or like kind of like a golf type shoe. But I have seen, um, I think this past season, there was a high school team that just dominated because they were wearing turf shoes on a against uh, 
it was like a wet turf field, and it improved their play a lot. So it just it's just going to depend to convince the players, I guess, and the teams as well. Right, and real quick, what sport do you think would benefit more if natural grass would have been would be mandatory? I think, well, I mean, for for soccer, it's mandatory. I mean, at least for FIFA and all that. And I think you know MLS, it's all uh, you know real grass, isn't it? I'm right. pretty sure. Yeah. So I think they're going to benefit way more. Hey Zeus. Um. I mean, soccer already has that natural grass implemented, but as you can see, when the NFL goes on to the uh, to go play in Europe and they play in grass stadiums, I've heard uh, I've seen reports of a lot of NFL players they like that style a lot more. So right. maybe NFL, but we'll see. Right. Well, that's all the time we have for this segment. Thank you to my guests, Mr. Weeks and Mr. Winces. I'm Tristan Harlan, and you've been watching the A State Sports Take. ASU TV, shows like Red Wolf Roundtable, ASU TV News, Westside Football, and more. Gain real life experience while doing what you love. Get involved with ASU TV today. ASU TV, covering all your favorite sports. From Red Wolf Roundtable to Westside Football and more, ASU TV has you covered. Tune in now to ASU TV for news and coverage on these sports and more. segment of the A-State Sports Take. I'm Chase Weeks along with my co-hosts Jacob Wasinski and Brady Michael. So in 2022, James Madison jumped from FCS to FBS and went 8-3 and three, and this year 11-1 and one. and from the jump to FBS, the NCAA uh, kept them from going into a bowl game or a conference championship game do you all think that that should change? Which one of us want to take this? I'll let you go out of Jacob. Okay, I mean, I will say this. Like, I think in a way, yes. Yes and no. I think yes because, I mean, you, you obviously want the best teams in, the, in, in your conference championship mm -hmm. alone, right? You want the best teams in the bowl game alone. But I think at the end of the day, James Madison knew what they were signing up for. They knew that this was something that was in the play that's been happening for two decades now at this point. We're yep. even going back to like, I know I keep bringing up South Florida, but South Florida, I mean, had this from nine and two in you know, 2000 to you know, not making a bowl game that year. It's, it's completely unfair, so I will say that, but it's been, there's a precedent that's been set that by the NCAA. There's a precedent that the NCAA has enforced this rule consistently, and James Madison knew what they were signing up for. So they're, in my opinion, should they? Yes, kind of, but are they? No. And I, I think it's the law. It's the rule of the law. Well, at the same time, you've seen so many things change in our quote-unquote microwave society. I'm sure it's a term you get tired of hearing. But you look at, like, the transfer portal, yeah. and that used to be where you have to sit out a year, and even now you still have to sign a waiver. But if you're a one-time transfer, now you get to instantly go ahead and get it in play. And I think that's what every team is kind of getting in the expectation of is now that they have jumped up a level, it's like, why are you getting punished for actually trying to build a reputable program? And in my eyes, you should be punished if you're going to drop down. You should be eliminated from, like, say, you're going from FBS to FCS, like Idaho did. You should have to pay the price and not be able to participate in the FCS playoffs because you're coming from a higher division level. And so that's kind of where I stand on that. I do think that James Madison deserves it 100%. And the thing that I would want to see is, like, are they the team that you would want to see in a, a New Year's Six Bowl? I mean, it would be fun. I mean, you have, you know, Jordan McCord, who's a great quarterback. I mean, you have Signetti, who's a great, you know, head coach. I mean, you know, darn near like a 30, you know, 70% winning percentage as a head coach mm -hmm. you know, throughout his whole career. So, I mean, I, I would like to see them there, but again, should they, under the rules, no. Again, everything has changed, but there are still certain things that they have shown that they will enforce that, mm -hmm. you know, in, including teams, right? So I think in a way, 
they're, I, again, I agree with you, but I disagree with you in a way. That that's, it's that's fun. Fair. They're fun. They're a very fun team, but I just don't think that, again, the precedent has been set for multiple universities. So, again, it would be weird and unfair to those universities that had to pay that price for James Madison not to. Yeah. Do you Strict agree rulebook. with the precedent, you know, yeah. that for two years you're not allowed to go into a bowl game or – uh, conference championship do you agree with that not just yeah. because of the precedent but yeah. do you agree with the ruling no I mean I don't mm -hmm. I mean to be fair I mean I, I I don't I think that again I want the best teams in bowl games and I want the best teams in a conference championship game you know James Madison has shown that they can run the gauntlet throughout the Sun Belt right they have they, they've beaten everybody and anybody in that conference pretty much so again should they I th yes they should they should I think again that precedent in my opinion is unfair but I think, again, that, that's just something that the NCAA has enforced through time and time again. And again, it, for me, it would be unfair to other institutions, like, like even Liberty to an extent, um, that had to pay that price um, knowing that you know, they, they jumped from FCS to FBS. Yeah, we didn't have to have this argument about Liberty whenever they made that jump exactly, because yeah, they yeah. weren't yeah. able to be in bowl contention for those first couple of years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But now, And you mentioned James Madison competing in the gauntlet. Their only loss this season was App State when they had all the attention on them. Definitely caused a lot of pressure there. So they're that close to being yeah. undefeated and the best group of five team in the country. Yeah. And you look at other FCS teams that are coming up now. I mean, Jacksonville State's a, they're in their first year and they're in a bowl game this year. Yeah. And the only reason that James Madison is in a bowl game is because there wasn't enough six win teams. And the same, I believe, goes for Jacksonville State. But everyone's talking about James Madison as far as that goes. So I would guess that the same precedent is for them as well. And But to get back on point here, I also disagree with that precedent because NCAA loves to get the money and they don't really – care about what the teams or the players have to do. Yeah, I do want to make it sure that I'm not going to bat for the NCAA. The NCAA is an awful organization. I think <laughs> we can all agree with that, that they're you know, objectively terrible. But I think, again, if you're looking at other institutions, um, as he drinks a thing of water, mm -hmm. I think, um, I think you know, again, with, when you look at other institutions, um, it, it would be unfair to those institutions that had to pay that price for you know, now for James Madison to get an exception because there's some pushback behind it. Because you know, yeah. I totally agree for you know, if – they drop from FBS to FCS. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The two-year ban, you know, because you you got all uh, a lot higher level recruits and yeah. program and going down to a lower level. I totally agree with that. But I, yep. you know, I don't see the point in having it for those that upgrade because you know, for like you said, for most of the teams, they're not winning out their first season. Yeah. When they jump, like I, I just don't agree with that. And we are starting to see that a little bit more, and it's because they're all jumping into the CUSA, and that's becoming the FCS to FBS <laughs> conference. We just yeah. saw the other day that Delaware is now in it. Apparently, Tarleton State is supposed to be joining the CUSA. Try to get that 12th team in there, yeah. Yeah, they have to. They're sitting at 11. Yeah. Uh, there's some others in there, Sam Houston State, which was quite a disaster. <laughs> so no need to mention them, but Jacksonville State, yeah, they went, what, 8-3, and 8-4 and four this year? Just... You're starting to see a lot more often, but that's because they're cramming those teams together. And that argument's eventually going to have to fade because you're always going to have a team, especially when you look at next season, they're just going to be at the top of that conference, and then you're going to try and have the same argument all over again, and it's going to just be kind of pointless because you've already seen the emotion that James Madison is getting out of people and us here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you also have like even like you know local representatives that are bringing this to the NCAA and saying that you know can oh, yeah, you please absolutely. change this. Yeah, you, Virginia, I believe it was Virginia District Attorney, I believe, is bringing this to NCAA and trying to force their hand into it. But they now, a little like bit said, of money they don't have to on that side too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they don't have to at this point uh, now that they've uh, now there's not enough six one teams. But again, I think when you look at James Madison, they're a fun team. Same with Jacksonville State. I mean, they have Rich Rod as their head coach, I mean, mm -hmm. who had a very fun offense at West Virginia. You know, didn't do well at Michigan, didn't do well at Ole Miss when he was an offense coordinator there. But I still think that when you – I think James Madison should be in, but, again, I don't – I just don't know if they will change it. It's the NCAA. They're, like I said earlier, they're awful. They're terrible, and I think they – are inconsistent with a lot of the rulings, but this is the only thing that they seem to be consistent with. And teams know that when they make that jump. Yep. So. Oh, they'll, they'll probably change it, you know, about 15 years from now, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> looking at James Madison, we need to, we need to fix this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, do you think, and I j this just popped up in my head, but do you think maybe in five, ten years there's going to be a different classification for some of the bigger schools? I, you know, I'm just because, yeah. you know, everybody's jumping from FCS to FBS, and I feel like, Pretty soon, FBS is going to be overcrowded, 
and you know it's just going to be a two-tier system and then they're going to make a whole other thing do you think there's going to be a possibility of that I think there's absolutely a possibility of it. You're going to see all of these FCS teams jump up to the FBS thinking that they're doing something. And then all of a sudden, you're going to have the super conferences become their own organization, and it's going to be just the new version of the FBS and FCS. That's the path that we're taking, and you see that with conference realignment. And that's why I think you're seeing all these FCS teams make the jump, because within the next five years, I think they're going to get separated. So they want one or two shots at a bowl game. Yeah. And, you know, with... I mean, SEC, ACC, a few others, like it's, you know, just with the money and everything, it's almost like minor league NFL these days. Yeah. And, you know, with the transfer it's portal, portal. Yep. it, you know, highest bidder wins all pretty much. Yeah, and that's what you're seeing right now is the beginning of everyone's dipping season for the transfer portal. And you're seeing all these guys from smaller classifications that are already trying to get their name out there. And just one random one, like Florida International's best wide receiver for the past two years, he's putting name, his name back in the portal. So, I mean, that's what you're going to see. There's no way to avoid it. Yeah, I mean, I will say, too, going back to what you were saying just real quick, um, you know, again, I think when you look at some of these teams are seeing all the money that they're getting from just TV revenues in general. They're not going to share that, and they're not going to share mm -hmm. that or that space with other institutions like FIU, like Sam Houston State. They're wanting to do their own thing, and like you said, we're seeing that with There's conference such a big gap. Absolutely. There's a huge gap, and, um, you know, with, with this new playoff, there may be a way that you can, um, you know, get that out, but um, I don't, you know, with, you know, uh, with group of five uh, tie-ins and stuff, but I just don't think that, you know, the gap will get any smaller, and I think you know you'll have a lot of uh, a lot of big time college programs like Ohio State, like Michigan, that want to do their own thing and just go off and do you know. Yeah, the biggest misconception I'll say quickly is that all of these teams from like the Sun Belt and the MAC have been tricked into thinking that they can make the national championship <laughs> since the playoff has begun, and yeah. the twelve team playoff will not change that. No, so. not at all. Yeah, it'll, 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 it's a false sense of hope, I think, in a lot of ways for yep. that. Yeah. But consensus is, you know, it's a pretty weak debate. We all think that James Madison honestly should have gone or been able to go to a bowl game. Absolutely, like. except for Mr. Rulebook over here. <laughs> Precedent, man. <Come> on. <laughs> well, thank you all for watching. That's all the time we have. I just want to thank my guest hosts, Jacob, uh, Jacob Lisinski and Brady Michael. And that's been the latest episode of the A-State Sports. ASU TV, shows like Red Wolf Roundtable, ASU TV News, Westside Football, and more. Gain real life experience while doing what you love. Get involved with ASU TV today. ASU TV, covering all your favorite sports. From Red Wolf Roundtable to Westside Football and more, ASU TV has you covered. Tune in now to ASU TV for news and coverage on these sports and more. Welcome to this latest segment of A-Steady Sport Tech. I'm Tika Lama. I'm joined by my guests Landon Clayton and Jisoo Lee. Um, today, we are, our topic for this segment is um, the pros and cons of legalized sports ga gambling. Uh, so it's among, um, when we see, like, um, there, even in, like, there are 50 states in the United States, and 33 plus uh, states are, um, they have already legalized sport betting through online or in person. So uh, it's going on and uh, uh, we want to discuss about uh, what are your takes on legalizing sport gambling? What are your thoughts on that? I'll begin. Um, okay. I think it should be legalized everywhere. Um, it's like you said, it's legalized in the majority of the states thus far. Mm -hmm. And it's, it really just connects, you know, people to the sport whether yeah. that be you know any sport but it just 
you know, brings more fandom to the game. You know, okay. baseball, football, basketball, hockey, soccer, tennis, you name it. Okay. You can bet on any sport, you know. So, mm -hmm. I just think, you know, there's obviously some cons to the – Okay. Um, to betting, gambling. But I think that all in all, it's going to just – bring more people to watch the sport and be involved in the sport. And I think there's really not that much harm in that. So, um, so if you, if there is a sports betting on every kind of sports, right? So it makes you fans are more mm -hmm. like more into the games. Yeah. So you agree on that thing? Yeah. So uh, it's kind of, of course the controversy. Some people may agree that sport betting is uh, good for uh, in game and some may not like even like for in terms of, it it is kind of addictive, right? So it could leads to gambling, and we can see lots of in college, um, college um, in college uh, students are from even it is legal. They have certain states has already um, um, like they have limited the age of 21. Some may may have 18, mm -hmm. um, but it's still there are 18 to 22 years. NCCA did a survey on on about um, um, about uh, how many people are illegally. Um, doing sport betting and 58 percent of respondents they did national survey right so 18 to 22 years of age people are involved Ill illegally in sports betting so um, what and and they have like kind of financial risks and and what what are your take on uh, how it affects on their academic um, kind of things when the, you are involved in um, that's kind of sporting in college if more teenagers are involved in like that thing. So, well, what are your take on if you're this Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you think about this? Yeah. Even though there are a lot of side effect, effect, but I think there are more advantage than that. So, I really agree with uh, legalizing the sports betting because the first reason is, uh, the legalizing sports gambling is can be can grow the economy like. Uh, it will generate significant tax revenue uh, for government. This revenue can be allocated to public service, like uh, such as like education or infrastructure or healthcare, like that. So, like based on IBIS world data, the sports global betting industry uh, reached reached a market market size of. Two for two billion dollar in 2022. So, uh, within this industry, the, there are over two two hundred thousand employees in a total of nearly two twenty five thousand business. So, uh, if this industry grow, then this field can lead to creation a lot of job creation. So, uh, and including like bookmaking or data analyze, so uh, this this also can be viewed as positive impact on the economy, uh, particularly in region where the industry is established. Okay, so, um, and, and, and uh, obviously if we uh, have legal, because if you are involved in um, betting kind of things, um, it's you. Are, you are never going to win the game, right? It's every time you will lose the game, and someone is always going to be benefited. So it's like it's if it is better for economy than so it's okay to make the sport betting legalized rather than like you. you if you you don't want to see um, the dark side of uh, sport betting, what about um, those who are there's always um, vulnerable people? They are involved in sport betting even there is like age limit right so so who, how can it be regulated who are responsible for this what what are your thoughts on this you mean about the uh, regulation of the age about age yes yeah so even even there is legalization of age but still people are involved i mean addicted if, to yeah that. addicted to this kind of thing so who uh -huh. are responsible how it can be regulated more yeah. Even it is legalized, I, I can understand that. Yeah, but um, I think, uh, however, the, a lot of studies have shown uh, this is not necessarily that in this case. So 
Um, in fact, most of pe most people who gamble doesn't addiction addiction and do so responsibly. So, uh, you know, uh, in Ve in Las Vegas, for example, in Las Vegas, there are a lot of gambling and gambling game and game casino in Las Vegas. But uh, all of them is not uh, visit like become a gambling addict. So, I think as there are le regulation on age. Uh, if they are altered, I think they can. They should. They should know how to control themselves. If they, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's my opinion. Okay. What about you, Landon? So, um, how it should be regulated for those who are involved in like uh, college students? They are even NCC did the survey, and um, they. They are in in every day in every game. They bet from one to fifty dollars, and but they are not winning. They are like more financially. They are getting down, and uh, though they are illegal, right? Illegal for them. So how can university cope up with these things? Maybe they need to. I don't know. Maybe what kind of um, uh, what kind of literacy or digital literacy. Um, because it's like now it's an online thing, right? So it's easy for anyone to go and bet, even they are um, under the age. So how do you think it can be more regulated? Though it's illegal, like they have 21, right? So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think there's just got to be some sort of verification system to where, you know, you type in, maybe take a picture of your identification card or like a driver's license uh -huh. or anything of that sort, and it shows your age and... You know, the, in, in this system, it'll happen to show if you're at a university or anything like that. And if you happen to play a sport, mm -hmm. then obviously it wouldn't let you do that. But obviously you still can at this point. It's just people do it, I guess, if they actually play the sport until they get caught, if they try to do that, I guess. But, yeah, I mean, with the age part, uh, it's pretty – most sites or uh, – books at this point would be using some kind of verification system where, you know, you'd give them your ID, your information, and it'll verify whether or not you're of age to be able to bet at that point. Okay. So having proper regulation on that is verification. But you still, I'm just curious how, like, through this, like, the result, right, survey, um, it's really interesting that 58% of respondents, even though they are, like, involved in this and um, and um, most of the most of the students are like 40 percent like even bad for others they do this kind of things happening even though they know that there is a kind a kind of limit thing um, so um, well I think um, this um, um, legalized sports gambling like it's from your take um, it should be legalized like in more uh, in every state like right. that. But it's still, there are all the, some states, they are banning this kind of things, right? Correct. Um, so, I guess, um, 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 this is... I think uh, if the sports betting will be all legalized, the, there will be like, stronger surveillance, like, mm -hmm. yeah, like, tennis... Uh, of illegal betting and it will contribute to like integrity of sports. Okay. So that's all time for we have for this segment. Thank you to my guest, Lenny Clinton and Disuli. I'm Tika Laman. You're watching A State Sports Tech.